I feel like we're in panto season. Go on. Hello! Oh, it's more for me than you. Just to let you know. Oh, no. Anyway, uh, I, I, we could be here all evening if we get into that, seriously. Um, so welcome, everyone, to the carol service. I hope you're ready to sing your lungs out, uh, because this is not an audience kind of just sitting there kind of evening. This is an audience stand up and go for it kind of evening, okay? Um, so none of this lip syncing with the songs. I actually need to hear some volume coming out of you as well. Um, so as we go through this evening, we're going to be looking at the kind of story of Christmas through the carols. And this evening we've got Stefan uh, Smart, who is a performer uh, and does a lot of work in the context of telling Jesus' story through uh, kind of drama and Kind of, I'm, I'm trying to think of different ways because uh, it's got here that in the context of the Bible, when the Bible was uh, being told before it was written down, it was done through people acting it out and kind of telling the story. And so Stefan's going to be doing that through the course of the evening as well. Um, and so at the end of this evening, there'll be a collection uh, for the buses outside because we've got two buses outside that have just started going into the local schools and supporting young people, especially around their mental health. And we want to be partnering with you uh, in the context of kind of keeping those buses running and the work that we're doing there. So there will be a collection at the end of the service if you are interested in getting involved. But also if you are interested in volunteering as a part of that team and possibly even driving the bus, uh, do let me know um, because we are looking for as many people to get involved with that project as we can. Also, uh, as we go through this service, I'm not going to pop up too much, I hope, um, but there will be time for us to pray, reflect, and just hear the story of uh, Christmas. So, you know what? I reckon we should probably start with Joy to the World. Why don't we stand together? Can you be a lot of singing over the next few minutes? The refrain for this song...
So what if everything that we're told it's all about Is little more than tinsel furnishing our doubts What if all the bright lights hanging on the tree Just draws our gaze away from what we need to see What if all the food's so bountifully laid Like paracetamol duels and keeps at bay Things we're not sure that we want to think about Things that might require us to turn and face our doubts What if Santa keeps our mind from digging any deeper What if all the wine does nothing to raise this sleeper What if Christmas cards just fabricate the truth That really we're all searching for some sort of proof That whilst we feel alone, there is hope beyond ourselves Hope that holds out more than Santa and his elves Hope that rides the wave of emotion that we feel To stand the test of time that tastes like something real Hope that in the end, though all other things fail There is something that through all things prevails A love that can't be put out like a flame A love from which the season boldly draws its name So look beyond the lights, the parties and all the games Beyond the nostalgia, the joys and all the pain Look beyond the songs and the carols known so well Listen again to the story they tell Because no one really thinks that it's all about the tree That it's all about the presence, that it's all about me No one really thinks that there's nothing more than that But are you going to look beyond the crepe paper hat? We're going to stand again and sing our next carol, Hark, the Herald Angels Sing. Why don't you stand with me?
great singing, everyone. Have a seat. I'm just going to do a reading from John 1, 1 to 5, and 9 to 14. Um, it's from the message verse, message Bible. So, the word was first, and the word present to God, God present to the world. The word was God, in readiness for God from day one. Everything was created through him. Nothing, not one thing, came into being without him. What came into existence was life. And the life was light to live by. The life light blazed out of the darkness, and the darkness could not put it out. The life light was the real thing. Every person entering life, he brings into light. He was in the world. The world was there through him, and yet the world didn't even notice. He came to his own people, but they didn't want him. But whoever did want him, who believed he was who he claimed and would do what he said, he made to be their true selves, their child of God selves. These are the God begotten, not blood begotten, not flesh begotten, not sex begotten. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes the one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous, inside and out, true from the start to finish.
What is it that we value most? What is it that lays hold to our attention, claims our affection, hijacks our ambition? What is it that we desire most? For we are desiring beings. We love, we want, we feel, we crave, we pursue. We long, each to their own. A relationship, a career, fame, money, power. Each treasures something. Something that offers wholeness, something that offers meaning, something that calms the sense of being incomplete, of being like a jigsaw with a few missing pieces. What is it that we value most? What do we chase? So often it's true that the things we pursue become the things we are captive to. So often the treasure that we chase becomes a shell, an empty space. Where we expected to find wholeness, we find it inadequate. Something pursued for the promise of joy that when achieved is lacking and void. Achievement melts into bereavement. We achieve our goals but lose our hope. We live by the mantra, when I achieve that, then I'll be happy. Then I'll feel enough. But when the goal is realized and happiness isn't, Hope takes the hit, and we grieve. It is the false horizon of hope, the promise made that can't be kept by so many of the things that we chase. Should we hope for anything more? Can we risk our hearts again? Is there a horizon that can be touched, a promise that will stand true in the end? Well, there is a story from long ago, an outrageous story that claims to know just what we need. It's a story about something more valuable than gold, a story too valuable to be bought or sold. It claims the greatest treasure the world could ever afford, but hidden in dirt and muck and straw. One more look before you dismiss it. Perhaps then, if you look hard enough at a stable and a feeding trough, you'll glimpse what the kings of old saw, and many, many millions more. A treasure, the hope of humanity, hidden in obscurity. You've already sung brilliantly, but we're going to do another carol, and it's O Come All Ye Faithful, so why don't we stand together?
There were some sheep herders camping in the neighborhood, and they'd set night watches over their sheep. And suddenly, God's angel stood among them, and God's glory blazed around them. They were terrified. And the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. The Savior is born today in David's town. A Savior who is Messiah and Master. This is what you're to look for. A baby lying in a manger, wrapped in a blanket. At once, the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. Glory to God in the highest heavens. Peace to all men and women on earth who please him. And as the angel choir withdrew into heaven, the sheep herders talked it over. Let's get over to Bethlehem as soon as we can and to see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. They left running and they found Mary and, and Joseph. And the baby lying in the manger. Well, seeing was believing. <laughs> they told everyone they met what the angel had said about this child, and all who heard them were impressed. But Mary, Mary kept these things within her, deep down within her, dear. The sheep herders returned. They let loose, glorifying and praising God for everything they'd seen and heard. It had turned out exactly the way they'd been told. And when the eighth day arrived, the day of circumcision, the child was named Jesus, the name the angel gave him before he was conceived. In Jerusalem at that time, there was a man. Simeon by name, a good man, a man who lived in the prayerful expectation of help for Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. The Holy Spirit had shown him that he would see the Messiah of God before he died, and led by the Spirit, he entered the temple, and as Jesus' parents brought in the child to carry out the rituals of the law, Simeon took him in his arms and blessed God. God, you can now release your servant. Release me in peace as you promised. With my own eyes, I've seen your salvation. It is out in the open for everyone to see. A God revealing light for the non-Jewish nations. Enough glory for your people, Israel. And Jesus' mother and father, well, they were speechless with surprise at, this, at these words. And, and Simeon, he went on to bless them. And he said to Mary, his mother, this child marks the failure and the recovery of many in Israel. A figure misunderstood, contradicted the pain of a sword thrust through you, but the rejection will force honesty as God reveals who they really are.
Do stay sitting down for this next song. If you know it, you're welcome to join in, but there's a video that's going to play while we sing this as well and just reflect on what we've seen and what we've heard so far.
Well, hello, everyone. My name's Jo. And can I just say a huge thank you on behalf of all of us to our band, who are doing such a beautiful job, aren't they, this evening, of leading us in our carols and in our singing. I don't know if you noticed on the way in, but we've got some big letters up in the entrance hall. In our church in December, our theme is hope, and you'll have walked past the H-O-P-E as you came in. You know, when we think about hope, often when we're talking about hope, we're talking about wishful thinking. We think, I hope I get that promotion in the new year. I hope my granny gets better. I hope I get all the presents on my Christmas list. And we say hope because we're uncertain. We don't actually know if we will get that promotion or if granny will get better or if all our Christmas dreams will come true. But, you know, as we think about Christmas and we look at the Bible, when the Bible talks about hope, it's talking about something different. Hope in the Bible is a confident expectation that God is going to do what he promised. A certainty that he can be trusted to do what he said. And this isn't just wishful thinking. This is based on the experience of millions of people over many generations that God is reliable and that he keeps his promises. The Bible says in Psalm 42, put your hope in God. And you can see on the screen, a passage in Jeremiah tells us, blessed, or that means happy, are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. You know, the promise of Jesus that we celebrate at Christmas is that even though the world is dark and many of us have a lot of difficulty in our lives, that there is a God who knows us and loves us and wants to walk through every day with us. Life with him is way better than life without him. And when we celebrate Christmas as we are this evening, we're not just looking back and remembering a baby, a historical event, a baby being born. As Christians, we're actually looking forward, knowing that Jesus is coming back again and we can put our hope in him. So how do we do this? Well, I was thinking about the word hope, and I came up with um, just something from the four letters, H-O-P-E. I think you call it a mnemonic. Oops, jumped ahead there. The mnemonic is hold on in prayerful expectation. At the time of the first Christmas, you may well know that the Jewish people were in deep trouble. They started out following God but they'd made some bad choices. And as a result, they were enslaved and they were oppressed for many, many years. And in their despair, they called out to God and he promised them a rescuer, a saviour who would come and help them. His coming was foretold in their ancient holy books many hundreds of years before the first Christmas. And there was huge anticipation. But I'm sure that as he failed to arrive, year after year, generation after generation that many may well have doubted whether those scriptures would ever come to be. But some people did continue to hope, to hold on in prayerful expectation. As Stefan so beautifully showed us from the Bible today, when the angel appeared to the shepherds, they said the good news is that the saviour, the master, is here. The promise has been fulfilled. But he's there in disguise. He's a baby and he's wrapped up in cloths And he's in a manger. Now for us, that looks super cute. It's very Christmas card worthy, isn't it? But as a parent, would you really want to put your newborn baby in a feeding trough? Is that the kind of place you'd expect to see a king? Then we heard how Simeon, that man who spent a long time praying and being with God, who was eagerly awaiting this long hoped for saviour, he was actually there at the time. He saw that promise fulfilled. He held Jesus and he said, I can die now. I know it's all going to be all right. And so we can see that God made a promise. He said, I'm sending a saviour. And the promise was fulfilled. Now, as Stefan said, when Simeon came, he described Jesus as a light to reveal God. Because if the God is who the Bible says he is, he's awesome and majestic. He's mighty. He's powerful. He's all-knowing. And I don't know about you, but I don't find that particularly relatable. And so he sent Jesus, 
God with skin on, to bridge the gap, to come to earth. And that makes him hugely relatable because he literally was born, and we've all been there. He was born, he grew up, he knows what it is to walk through the challenges of life. Jesus is a, is a historical figure, as you probably know. But he didn't just stay as a baby. He grew up and lived the most remarkable life. And everywhere he went, people were drawn to him. And he changed their lives. There are, an, there are amazing records of him doing this throughout the Bible, where there are eyewitness accounts. And you know, as you open your papers or if you look at the news today, we are longing for people who are going to lead us well, aren't we? We're looking for leaders who are moral and who are effective, who are kind, who look out for the vulnerable, who help the oppressed, who've got solutions for the difficult situations of life. And Jesus was and is one such leader. In fact, Pete read that passage from John, didn't he? Who said, Jesus is generous inside and out, true from start to finish, just the kind of leader they needed then and we need now. But as Stefan showed us, what Simeon said to Mary was, look, many are going to oppose him. He'll be misunderstood and contradicted. And this came true. He caused huge problems to the religious leaders of the day and they killed him. And for many people, this was unexpected. The promised saviour of the world, dying on a cross. Now that might look like a disaster, God's plan gone belly up but actually it was the fulfillment of another promise because Jesus had said I'll die and come back to life and that promise was fulfilled too before he left and went to go to heaven Jesus said I've got to go away and when I've done that I'll send my spirit so that you can all have my presence with you I'm not just a man confined to one place and one time I am God with you, present to anyone who wants to know me. And Jesus, having appeared to over 400 people over a period of 40 days, went back to heaven and sent his spirit. And in the Christian calendar, we celebrate that at Pentecost. Lots of people were quite bewildered. But there were people who were holding on in prayerful expectation. And you know, the Holy Spirit lives in and with anybody who wants to follow God. Ordinary people like you and me can have a relationship with him. And as we get to know him better, he brings change and transformation in our lives. We've seen examples of that in our church family this year. We've had people who needed work. And as we've prayed and as they partnered with God, they've got jobs. We've had people who've been in really difficult financial situations. And money has come through for them as it's been needed. We've had people who've been in physical pain who've got better and others in hugely stressful situations who have found an inexplicable inexplicable peace. Those kind of events were happening around Jesus all through the Bible, all through history and are still happening today. And so God made a promise. I'm sending my spirit and the promise was fulfilled. So that's three big promises made by God. Do you remember the first one was, I'm sending a saviour, and he did, he sent Jesus. The second one was, I'm going to die, but I will come back to life again, and that's what happened to Jesus. And the third one was, I'm going to send my spirit, and that's what happened too. So that's why we can have confidence in his fourth promise. He's promised that he's coming back, but this time he's not coming as a baby, He's coming back as the rightful king of the whole world. It's a big claim, but he's been right three times already. And so I, for one, am going to trust him for the fourth. So Jesus' promise is two. I'm coming back again. What are we going to do about that? Well, as I mentioned earlier, as well as making a huge impact on people, the ordinary people of the day, Jesus had a lot of discussions with the religious leaders. They all had opinions about the best way to connect with God. And it was generally based around a load of rules and regulations. And now Stefan's going to come back up and tell us what what Jesus had to say in one of those situations. Then they sent some Pharisees and Herodians to catch him in his words. Teacher, 
We know you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the word of God in accordance with truth. Now, um, tell us, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? Bring me a denarius. Let me see it. So they brought the coin. And Jesus said, Whose portrait is this? Whose inscription? Hmm? Caesar's, they replied. Then give to Caesar what is Caesar's. But to God, what is God's? And they were amazed at him. A teacher of the law came by. He heard them debating. And seeing that Jesus had given a good answer, he said to him, Teacher, of all the commandments, which is the most important one? The most important one, Jesus answered, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor. As yourselves. There's no greater commandment than these. Oh, well said, teacher, the man replied. You're right in saying that God is one and there was no one but him to love him with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our strength and understanding. <laughs> And to love our neighbors as ourselves. Well, <laughs> it's better than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he'd given a wise answer, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one had dared ask him any more questions. Thank you, Stefan. Isn't it lovely to have the Bible come alive like this? Um, Stefan knows the whole of the Gospel of Mark. That was an extract from Mark. And in February, we'll hear, you'll hear a bit more later, but he's going to be coming and um, performing or embodying that for us. And so one for your diary, the, the 9th of February next year will be a, ta- a day to come and, and see more of the Bible come alive in that way. But the question I had was, God made a promise, he's coming back again. What do we do about that? Well, you know, Jesus had a message, didn't he, for that guy, that religious leader. And he has got a message for each of us tonight. The thing about that guy was, he knew the right things to do. He knew that he was supposed to put God first. And then from the outflow of that, that he was supposed to love his neighbour. And I love what Jesus said to him. He said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. In fact, another translation says, you're almost there. You're right on the border of God's kingdom. And perhaps like that guy, you're here tonight, and you are right on the border of God's kingdom. Maybe you've been looking at the claims of Jesus, or seen something of him in the kindness of a friend, or had a dream or a spiritual experience that points you towards him. He's inviting you to cross the border to choose to become part of the kingdom where he's the king of your life. You know, my son was talking to a friend the other day about Jesus, and his friend said, I, the thing is, I know what the Bible says. It says you can't go to heaven if you do bad stuff. And I've done all the wrong stuff already, so I've given up on that option. This guy was only about 18. I've done all the wrong stuff already, and I've given up on that option. I thought the thing is, JJ's friend was right. 
He knows that the stuff that we do wrong separates us from God. It stops us being connected with him. The Bible calls that stuff sin, S-I-N. And I read this week, you know, that letter in the middle, the I, is the bit that really gets us in trouble. It's where we put ourselves first rather than God, as Jesus just showed. But the problem is not final. And this was the bit that JJ's friend didn't know. Because Jesus lived a perfect life, because he died on the cross, because he rose again and came back as he promised, he restored the connection that we can have with God. You know, as Pete said of Jesus in that very first reading, he, that's Jesus, came to his own people, but they didn't want him. But whoever did want him, that includes you and me, who believed he was who he said he is and would do what he said, he made to be their true selves, their child of God's selves. And so to live life in God's kingdom, we need a special kind of visa. To cross that border, there has to be a way in. And Jesus has paid for that already, but we have to apply for the visa. To live in that kingdom, we have to choose to leave our old way of life behind, giving up our way of doing things and putting God first in everything. And that's what it means to put our hope and our trust and our confidence in God. And, you know, if you'd like to find out any more about that, I'd love to chat with you after the service. Or we've got these free little books, which are called The Christmas Connection, which you'd be so welcome to take home and read at your leisure. And so Jesus' message If you are very close to the border, is why don't you come on in? I'd love you to be in the kingdom with me. But also I think he's got a message for some of us too who are in the kingdom, who have stepped over the border. And we feel at the moment that we are just about managing to hold on. Perhaps we have a crisis in our family. Perhaps we have a challenge in our health. Maybe we have a deep need or a deep longing that isn't being filled. We feel like we're holding on by our fingertips this Christmas. And God's message is, just come to me. And that's where the prayerful expectation bit comes in. Because some people think that praying is just another thing they have to add to their list. But in fact, praying is just the way that we connect with the God who loves us. And sure, we bring our needs and our longings to him. But really, it's just a case of being with him. We invite him to come and work in our lives and in the lives of those around us. It's something to open to all of us, just talking to him as a friend. And so perhaps this Christmas, you need encouraging in your prayerful expectation. Perhaps you haven't been looking towards Jesus or coming close to him for a while he just says come back here I am and I'm waiting for you there's a beautiful prayer which is written in Romans 15 and it says this it says may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit and that hope that we can experience as followers of Jesus is something that we can be so filled with that it overflows to other people. And if that's what you need tonight, that's available to you too. We're going to sing another carol now. It's one called In the Bleak Midwinter. I don't know if you know this one already. It's a bit more of a modern carol. And it does make me smile a little because it talks about there being terribly cold and bad weather, which I don't kind of think about what I think about Israel and the Mediterranean climate there. But what it does remind me of is that sense of the world which is waiting and longing for God. If you've read The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis, it talks about a time when it was always winter and never Christmas. Yet the invitation of Christmas is that as we welcome Jesus into our hearts and into our lives, and we don't need to live in the cold any longer, but we can live in connection with him. Why don't we stand together and think about what we've been listening to and reflect on that as we sing this gentle carol.
gusty wind may moan Earth stood hard as iron Water like a stone Snow had fallen, snow I'm just going to take a moment and pray around this idea of hope, that hold on in prayerful expectation. With just a question for you, what are you holding on to in prayerful expectation? I'm going to do three prayers. One prayer which is for our world at this time. One that's for our community and then one for ourselves. Within each prayer, I'm just going to pause and just allow a moment to reflect and just to ask you to have a think about what can we hope for and hold on to in prayerful expectation. Father God, we've heard that you are God of hope and yet it's in short supply in much of our world. We pray first for those who are only just holding on in places of conflict, famine, and despair. Take a moment and reflect. What can we hope for, for our world?
And so, Father, we ask for your help and intervention to bring peace in conflict, solutions in famine, and hope where there is despair. And Father, we pray for those in our communities and our neighbourhoods who are grieving this Christmas, those who are struggling with illness or family changes. Take a moment and think about your community, those people who are around you, and what can we hope for? And so, Father, we ask that you com comfort those who mourn, bring strength, courage, and healing to those who need it. And Father, we pray for ourselves. What are we hoping for in our own lives? And so, Father God, please help us to hold on to you in the middle of challenges and to fill us with your joy and your peace as we trust in you. Amen. Nice. What a lovely evening. Thank you so much for joining us for this carol service. Um, a couple of notices. First and foremost, we would love for you to stay at the end and join us for some mulled wine and some mince pies. Um, otherwise, I have to eat them all, and I can't. Um, and also, we would love for you to join us for other Christmas events. So we have a family nativity that's going to be going on on the 19th of December from 10 o'clock till 12 o'clock with real-life animals from local farms. We've got crafts, we've got refreshments. It's aimed at the primary age, um, so do feel free to book. Uh, you can either book online or let us know that you're interested. And also on Christmas Eve, we have a service. It's at 10.30 on Christmas Eve, which is, which is a good thing. Um, we've got that infamous DIY nativity. You know the one where you have to dress up as a camel, a character, um, uh, or just bring a cheerful jumper like mine. Then also we will have... Uh, if you've enjoyed Stefan's performance, uh, we have this I Am Mark that's going to be happening on Friday the 9th of February. We would love for you to book in on that. We have uh, early doors tickets which are going on sale from this evening till the end of December, and it's on the 9th of February. So, also, as I said right back at the beginning, we have the collection for the Vineyard bus which is outside. Feel free to give cash, or if you want to give by card, you can do so. And also, if you want to partner with us and become a bus driver or volunteer, please let us know, because it would be lovely to have you involved. But apart from that, let's sing our final song together, the one that Nigel introduced earlier, the Ding Dong Merrily on High. Why don't you stand together, and uh, we're going to finish with a bang and celebrate and sing together. Okay, sing together everybody. Ding dong. 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 Here we go.
joining us. Happy Christmas. See you soon. Enjoy some more wine. Thank you to everybody who's taken part. Have a great evening. Bless you. <laughs>